I'm Joshua Berman of Bar Ilan University. Many people think of the Torah, the five books of Moses, as a book of religious ideas. But the Torah was also a revolutionary book of political ideas. Throughout the ancient world, the truth was self-evident. All men are not created equal. These cultures celebrated hierarchy. Everyone knew his station in life, each according to his class. By contrast, and for the first time in history, the Torah presented a blueprint for society to take power from the powerful and to place a newfound emphasis on the common man. I'd like to share with you how the Torah introduced six big ideas that are cornerstones of our own political and economic order today. The first big idea is the rule of law. In the ancient world, law was composed and promulgated by kings who were above the law, not subject to it. The Torah takes us from the law of rule to the rule of law. Long before the thinkers of Athens, the Torah introduced to the world the idea of equality before the law. All public institutions in the Torah, the judiciary, the priesthood, the monarchy, the institution of prophecy itself, are all subordinated to the law. Big idea number two is rule by popular consent. There is no record in the ancient world of a nation choosing its king or of citizens appointing their own judges. Yet in the Torah, the people choose their king. There is a modern idea, it's credited to Montesquieu, that for the people to trust the judicial system, it is essential that judges receive their appointment from the people themselves. Prior to Montesquieu, that idea is found in only one other text, the Torah. Our third big idea is that all citizens are eligible for office. We take it as a given that all citizens can run for public office, but it wasn't always this way. Consider the British parliamentary system. It has a House of Lords and a House of Commons. The thinking was to divide legislative power so that the two houses could balance each other. But notice who is given power. Throughout the history of governments in which several bodies share power, the concept was always the same. You identify the competing classes within society and assign each a little bit of the power. By design and by definition, you can hold a political office only if you belong to the right social group. Only with the American Founding Fathers do we eventually find a new notion of political office without reference to class and which any citizen can hold. This revolutionary notion of political office has only one precursor, the Torah. Any citizen may be chosen to be king and any citizen may be chosen to be a judge. In the Torah, it turns out that God is an economist. Here we find the Western tradition's first prescription for an economic order that minimizes distinctions of class based on wealth and instead ensures the economic security of the common citizen. For without equity, there is no equality. The fourth big idea is bankruptcy protection. In the ancient world, land was owned by the king and by the temples, while the common folk worked as serfs or sharecroppers. But in the Bible, God, who owns the land, gives it over to the people of Israel. And so here we have history's first example of universal private ownership of land by the citizens. And when a landowner became insolvent and sold his land, the Torah ensured that the land would revert back to that man's ownership during the Jubilee year, history's first example of bankruptcy protection. Our fifth big idea is the idea of redistributive taxation. In modern capitalist societies, social justice is served by taxing those that are most successful to aid those that are less fortunate. In the pre-modern world, this idea is unheard of. Historically, taxes were levied to support the palace and the temples. Only in the Torah 
do we find a tax that productive farmers pay to support the less well-off? History's first redistributive tax for a social purpose. And finally, the sixth big idea is the creation of the week and the weekend. What is most remarkable about the Torah's economic reforms is the manner in which the way we measure time itself is marshaled to achieve social justice. In the ancient world, calendars measured days, months, and years, but not weeks. Days, months, and years were measured on the basis of the astronomic cycles of the sun and the moon. The week, however, is the invention of the Torah, and is rooted, of course, in the Torah's account of creation, in which God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. In the ancient world, people worked day in and day out. By contrast, the Torah says that all must be granted rest one day a week, giving us ultimately the modern concept of a weekend. Not all great advances in political and economic thought are found in the Torah. Yet it is difficult to think of another document that revolutionized so much and with so little precedent to inspire it.